So, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, delighted to be here for lots of reasons, uh, but also feeling a little challenged being here this evening amongst people who I know really well, some people I've just met, friends, colleagues. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, but be here in a different uh, context to normal. I was glad to see you've got champagne in your hand as well. Bert said you can't hear my speech without drinking. I don't know what you meant by that. <laughs> so for, for the last uh, six years now, I guess, I've been doing motivational speaking, linking what I've done in my sporting life to how you can achieve and how you can develop in personal and business life as well. Because not everyone wants to run across the desert or run over the Alps or run through the Arctic, which I'll talk about in a little while. But everybody's got something they want to achieve. How many people here have got a big goal they want to achieve? Something big that they're really excited about they want to achieve? Lots of people, right? How many people have got a dream that they'd like to turn into a goal? So, so what, I've, what I've tried to do with the, the stuff I'm going to talk through this evening is to give you some thoughts of steps you can use to achieve those big goals, whatever that big goal might be. And everybody's different. And this is one of the things I love about doing these speeches over the last number of years. In fact, it's interesting, Chris reminded me six years ago, one of the speeches I did was to his team in the UK, one of the first speeches I did. And I remember people, someone coming up to me, I don't know if it was that speech or another one, someone came up to me afterwards and said that as a result of the speech, they'd gone and done a bike ride from London to Paris. Someone else had gone for a job move that, that into a, a, a more senior job that they hadn't thought about doing. So the feedback was, was fantastic. That really, really motivated me. Um, but one of, the, one of the great things about the linking the sporting team is because when you do big sporting challenges, it really pushes you to think things through. So I'm going to share with you an experience I had earlier on this year. But to, to start off with, what I'd like you to do is just imagine the coldest you've ever been. Think about the coldest you've ever been. Was it in the mountains in Switzerland on a cold winter's day, wind blowing? Was it in a cold day in the UK in the, the hills? Not well, doesn't get that cold in the UK or in Munich. When's the coldest you've ever been? If you think about the inside of a fridge. In the late here last May. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, was, that was about minus eight or something. So the, if you think about the inside of a freezer, it's minus 15 degrees. So when you freeze food, it's about minus 15 degrees centigrade. So think about the coldest you've ever been. Now imagine minus 55 degrees centigrade. Just think about minus 55 degrees centigrade for a second. Just picture that in your head. Then. You all come from uh, different countries or different places. Try and picture a distance of 300 miles or 500 kilometres in your head. Thank you. Two cities that are distance 500 kilometres or 300 miles. Just try and picture that in your head. Keep the picture of minus 55 degrees, 500 kilometres, 300 miles. Now imagine walking in that temperature that distance, putting a pulp that weighs about 25 kilograms through one of the most hostile areas in, on the planet for six days and 19 hours. So while you've got that picture in your head, let me show you a couple of pictures to show you what it's like. Yeah. 
it's that like at minus 55 degrees out in just below the Arctic Circle. Now I know everybody, so lots of people with their hand up and ask who's got a big goal. Everybody's on a different stage of maybe achieving that goal, maybe not starting achieving that goal, maybe just thinking about doing it, or maybe it's just still a dream. And the great thing about any kind of talk is you can get out of it what you want, because everybody's on a different stage of the journey. You know, this 40 minutes is, a, is not about business, it's about investment in you and what those goals might be. It might be a sporting goal, a personal development goal, a business goal, it could be anything. When I've, whenever I've taken on a big challenge, one of the things I learned, and I had six days and 19 hours on my own to think through, why do I always keep achieving these big goals? What's the recipe? What's the formula? One of the, one of the things I sat down to do when I got back, or when I started off on this journey, was I started mapping out a timeline. And I'd encourage anybody before you start on a, a, goal, a, a journey towards achieving a big goal to map a timeline. So I mapped two timelines. One of them was a career timeline, one of them was a sporting timeline. And what, the reason for doing this, the reason it's really powerful, is because if you look at where you've come from, I mean, I look around this room and I know some of the fantastic achievements that people have achieved in this room. I know some of the experiences in this room. But have you ever sat down and mapped out where you started and where you've come from? Now, why is that useful? Because when you're achieving a big goal, when I talk about goals, I'm talking about big goals, not incremental changes, but big goals. When you're looking at achieving a big goal, if you look where you've come from, it doesn't look so scary. It doesn't look so frightening when you're thinking about that big step. The thing that's stopping most people from going for a big goal is because it's fear of action. It's fear of action for a number of reasons, fear of failure or fear of success. But if you look at where you've come from, it starts feeling a little bit easier. So you can see here, I mean, I've got, as an introduction to my kind of sporting background, or my physical experiences, you know, I went through uh, marathons, Ironmans, multi-day events in the desert, running around the Alps, out in the Kalahari Desert, and then into the Arctic this February, the, the, just gone. If you, you know, the, the old adage, yeah, everyone's heard the old adage, is what creates a diamond? Lots of pressure. The more pressure you can layer on yourself for the reason why, externally, the better. Now, I, I don't often do these challenges for charity unless I think I could fail. And on this one, let me tell you, when I entered this race, even with all my experience, I didn't think I could finish this. I thought it was a step too far, and I was going to have to, fail. I was going to, have to handle something that I'd never handled before, which was failure. So I, I agreed to, spot, to sponsor um, a, a charity. In fact, what, it's a charity called Humanity Direct, and it was this, you, you pick a specific person that you are going to raise money for. And there's a little girl called Grace in Africa, in Uganda, who hadn't, was born with no ears. She couldn't hear, so she couldn't go to school. And my challenge was to raise £5,000 so she could have two operations on her ears so she could then go to, to hospital. <coughs> so that created pressure on me. Because then I started thinking about race when I was doing the training and when I was out in the event. So these two things are really key. Internal reasons why, great. But the more you can build up those external reasons why, the more likely you are to be successful. So second step in achieving any big goal. You've got to prepare well. So let me share with you the way I prepared for this event, and this could apply to anything. The left-hand side on this slide here shows a couple of books by guys who've been out there. Best way of learning how to achieve a big goal, find someone who's already done it, learn from them, ask them as many questions as you can, get their insight into how they did it, so that you can, there's not many things that you would want to do that someone hasn't already done. If you think about your big goal, who, who could you go to and learn from who's already done it? These guys have both written books on the topic. The guy at the top on the left, Mark Hines, he's a completer. So he's complete, he completes races. The guy at the bottom is a competitor. So I wanted to learn from both of them because they've both got different bits of advice. And I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. My first goal with anything like this is to complete it. My second goal is to be a competitor. 
So I learned from them, I got lots of advice from them. Of course, one of the challenges is when you ask for advice, what do you get? You get conflicting advice. You get someone will tell you, or you get confusing advice. So you have to take your own experience from your timeline and filter that out. Make your own decisions based on the information you're getting from your, the people you're asking. Now I call these, in business you call these people mentors or coaches. It's the same thing. Who's done it before who could mentor you to achieve what you want to achieve? Now, one of the things I also learned is in preparation for an event, you're moving yourself along this scale at the bottom here. Because when you enter an event, like this event, especially if there's a chance you could die, or you could lose fingers or toes, you're at this end of the scale, trust me. You're in fear. And normally that's what paralyzes most of us from taking action to achieve whatever big goal it is you're thinking of achieving. By doing, going through these steps of preparation, you're moving yourself along this line from fear, concern, anxiousness, to confidence. And the more you can do, the more confident you become. So the first step is mentors, coaches, who's done it before. So the, the next piece is prepare specifically for what you're going to do. So when I was having to run across the desert, I'd run with a 10 kilogram back on my back for a year before I ran everywhere with a 10 kilogram pack on my back. When I was training for the Arctic, I walked around the Chilton Hills for every morning for months pulling a tire behind me to get ready for what it was going to be like pulling a pulp in the Arctic. One of the things I've also learned is you need to push yourself in training or in preparation. So between Christmas and New Year this year, I went, or well actually last year, it was about 28th of December last year, I did an 80 mile walk up the Grand Union Canal in the UK, 40 miles out, 40 miles back, pulling a tyre, took me 26 hours, but when I finished it, imagine how confident I felt about my ability to be able to get through some really hard times. So by doing, by pushing yourself in preparation, in the army it is, you know, train hard, fight easy. It's the motto in one of the regiments I was in. So you, you learn to prepare well, and then you, you feel more confident when you stand at the start and you move along this, this line here. You've got to look at the kit as well. You'd be surprised how many people turn up to events with cellophane still wrapped around the kit they bought. But they've not tested, they've not tried. I went to the Alps in December last year to try some of the kit I've been recommended to buy. I was at the top of one of the mountains in snow, cold day, thick gloves on, which I'd have to wear in the Arctic. One of these pressure stoves where you have to get a little bit in the bottom of the reservoir, set light to it. You try doing that with thick gloves on. It's absolutely useless. So I've been that stove. We've got a really simple one. You just pour the fuel in, you just put a match in it, and start. There's kit for these type of events I've never heard of. There's, has anyone ever heard of something called NEOs? Do you all know what NEOs are? Maybe some from the Nordic country will know what NEOs are. NEOs, it's nothing to do with the matrix. NEOs, are, in fact Ian and Michelle will know what is, the NEOs are because you've heard the speech. NEOs are big boots that you put your shoes into and with your feet, you know, and pull them up. Why do you need NEOs? You need NEOs because of something called overflow. What's overflow? I thought, just, I thought it was a car park. When a car park gets full, you go to the over. Overflow is where ice, water comes up through the ice and you get a thin layer of frozen water on top. And the hazard is you can fall through it. And you can fall through it up to your waist sometimes. Now, if you get up to your waist in minus 55 degrees temperature, you're in trouble. So you've got to react quickly. You've got to get a fire going quickly. So the NEOs are great because you pull them up sort of here and if you go through overflow and fall through, chances are it won't be that deep and you're not going to get soaking wet feet and clothes. So, so you learn a whole new language when you start looking at researching. And it, whatever goal it is, whatever thing, thing you're thinking about that's new, you'll probably find there's things that you didn't know even when you started on that journey. Even up to the day before the race, two days before the race, we were taken out on a four hour training event. So we got there, we had to go out into the middle of nowhere and we had to prove that we could start a fire, light our stove, put our shelter up, get in our sleeping bag. 
That evening, I learned stuff I wasn't ready for. I learned things that I could do better. For instance, I bought this really expensive turbo lighter, like a flamethrower lighter, which is great at minus 10, minus 15, minus 20. Once you get to minus 55, the fuel just freezes, or it goes all gloopy, so it doesn't work. So the only thing that works out there are either fire lighters or matches. This picture here is of me lighting fire. So those that know me know I'm quite competitive. So when they said, we want to see you light a fire, light a stove, put your shelter up, get in your sleeping bag, I thought it was a race. So I grabbed stuff off trees, chucked them on the floor, threw some fuel on it, set light to it. There's my fire, first one, I've one. It went out in about 30 seconds. <laughs> So I then thought, hang on a second, you know how to light a fire now. Stack it properly, get it set up. So I had to do it again. And so I was learning all the way through it. But all of this, it, you can't, I mean, you can, I was going to say you can't do enough preparation. You can over prepare paralysis analysis, you, which stops you from actually taking progress. But preparation is key. Learning from people, specific preparation, and then testing the kit. You also can't go into any big challenge without a plan. You know, if you start on any journey without a map, without knowing where you're going, the chances of getting there are going to be slim. So having a plan is key. But having a plan that says, I'm going to start here and in 300 miles I'm going to finish here, is not a great plan. Because it's too much for the brain to cope with. The brain can't cope with I'm going to do 300 miles in six days. So you've got to break it down into manageable chunks. You've got to break it down into things that the brain can cope with so that it doesn't seem so overwhelming. So this is a real, a real outline of my plan. My plan was 50 miles every day. I had eight days to finish. If I did 50 miles every day, then I knew I was going to finish in time. <clears throat> I was going to stop every two hours, have a 15, two and a half hours, have a 15 minute break. I was going to Eat, uh, have a drink and water because it's very easy to forget to hydrate when you're out in these kind of conditions because you're not feeling thirsty but you need to hydrate regularly. Hydrate me every half an hour. I wanted to try and finish the first 100 miles as quickly as I could so I'd broken the back of the event. So I built a plan and I got myself ready and I chunked it down into small sections so that I knew I could cope with this, my brain could cope with it. And whatever goal you're trying to achieve whatever goal you're thinking of, you have to break that plan down, because otherwise it just is overwhelming and you won't start. But once you've got that, once you've got your reasons why, once you've done your preparation, once you've built your plan, then you've got to take the biggest step of all. You've got to actually take that step over the start line and make the commitment. And that's a really hard step to make. You can spend ages doing preparation and planning, but at some point you've got to commit yourself. And what I've learned in doing a number of these events is you go up to the start line being anxious, concerned, but once you're committed, once you're actually in it, there's no option. You turn your mites into must. You go from, I might be able to get through this, I'm not sure. You go to, I'm going to get through this. I must get through this. There's no other option, I'm going to get through this. So that's what I felt when I went over the start line at the, on the 10th of February this year. I was uncertain, but as soon as I went over that start line, it became a must. Biggest step of all, that is, for anybody to take. This was the start line. Interesting experience going across the start line in the Yukon. So you imagine you've got a pulp, which is about three, four metres behind you. You've got... Uh, 100 people starting, two by two. It's like a, a load of HGV lorries, you know, big long lorries uh, going along. And so it took about 20 minutes to get everyone over the start line. This guy on the right here um, is, he's a Mexican. Because Mexico is one of the countries best known for its Arctic conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, and you can see, he's a really great athlete. Sponsored by lots of people. Nice guy, actually. Nice guy. And I'll tell you a story about him in, in a minute. Really excited, really keen, very fit. There was a lot of fit people there, actually. A lot of fit people out there. 
So this was our stepping over the start line. It was about minus 35 degrees when we started, 10 o'clock in the morning on February the 10th. And my, as I said, my brain went from, I might do this, but I must do this. So then I'm on the journey. So I'm in, I'm going. This is me coming up to the marathon mile. The marathon mile was the first checkpoint. And some of the locals run the marathon when they go home. So there were some people pulled out of the marathon point. And it was getting colder by this point. Now you see I'm pretty happy coming up there. I was pretty happy because I'd done it in six hours. Walking, stopping every two, or two hours, 30 minutes, having a 15 minute break. So I was pretty pleased. And I, was, I did run a little bit, but you have to try and keep the temperature down in the, in the Arctic because of these kind of temperatures, you sweat, clothes freeze. I mean, some of you guys will know that well. You know, you're in trouble. So you've got to try not to overheat too much, but keep yourself going. And that's one of the things I found most strange actually to start with was I was taking more clothes off in these temperatures. It was really weird. <coughs> so I then headed out from the marathon point. <coughs> the next checkpoint is 56 miles. A place called Dog Grave Lake. Great name. But not great for the dog that died there, I guess, but great name. 56 miles. So I've done 26 miles in six hours. So I figured 30 miles, eight hours should be fine. I'll be there by about two in the morning. So I headed off into the night, and you, if you ever heard the expression, a great plan doesn't, doesn't survive engagement with the enemy. You ever heard that expression? So you might have a great plan, but when you actually, when you're actually out there, it changes. So I'll give you an example. So I'm heading off into the night, it's like getting dark, about two hours off the marathon mark. I'd made myself some really great sandwiches to eat that first night. Now, do you want to have the sandwiches when you get down to about minus 50 degrees? <laughs> All they're good for is a bank robbery thrown through a window. So I had a pulp full of bricks, basically, that uh, I chucked. So I, great preparation there. Cheese is just like rocks. In fact, I was starting to learn that food is a real challenge, because you know, I had, I had a billeton, or beef jerky. And the only way I could eat it was to suck it for about five minutes to warm it up so I could then eat it. So until you're there, you can't learn, but you have to learn and adapt. So you have to try and find a way of dealing with it. So I was learning this all the way through. As I was going through the night, I was starting to feel tired. I knew it was getting colder because my pulp was sticking to the snow. It was almost every step, it was freezing to the snow. So it got to about midnight. And I'm still going, to think, you know, this checkpoint's not far away. It got to about one o'clock. And I was really starting to feel tiredness in my legs. I, on my own in the middle of nowhere, I hadn't seen anyone for hours. In the middle of the woods, pitch black, first night, I'm feeling really tired. So I had to make a decision. And making a decision at that point, to, I had to make a decision to stop and get some rest. Now, I'd, I'd been doing my, I was down to two hour stops by then, by the way. The plan had adapted. Two hour stops for 10 minutes. So, I made a decision to stop. Now, making a decision to stop when the temperatures were down at minus 50, minus 55 degrees was pretty difficult and quite frightening. You're in the middle of nowhere, it's really dark, and you're going to stop on the side of the trail at those temperatures. But I made a decision that was the right thing to do. So, I jumped in to the uh, uh, got to the side of the track, pushed my pulk in, smoothed the snow out, and set my tent up, got myself ready. Um, got myself ready to get in. And you've got to be quick. In those temperatures, you've got to be quick. Sleeping bag out. The other thing I learned then is clothing that says it operates in minus 30 degrees, minus 35 degrees, doesn't quite operate the same at minus 55 degrees. Imagine clothing goes brittle. It goes very brittle, cloth and, and material goes really brittle. So I put my sleeping bag out in the tent, open the zip, the, the, the sleeping bag got a bit like tissue paper. The zip ripped the top of the sleeping bag, tent suddenly full of feathers. I didn't have time to think about it, I just had to jump in and end the sleeping bag, it was so cold, I had to jump in the sleeping bag, get, get myself in there, and then take my clothes off, because one of the things you never do is sleep in your clothes. And a sleeping bag, sleep bag should cope without all your clothes on. I'll tell you some stories about people who made that mistake in a minute. 
So I got in there and I got a couple of hours sleep. I felt pretty good. I got a couple of hours sleep about 4.35 in the morning. I woke up, cold sleep uh, seeping into the sleeping bag. And then I had a little panic attack because I thought, I'm not even at 56 miles yet. It's minus 50, well I didn't know it was minus 50, I just knew it was very cold. It was very, very cold. I could feel it coming in. I thought, I've got to get up and keep going. I'm not even 50 miles into this race yet. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience. When you get overwhelmed with something, I don't know how you cope with it, but this is one of the coping strategies I found is breaking things down into tiny little chunks. You know, I talked earlier about breaking the plan down. So I broke down, how am I going to get out of this sleeping bag? So right, start with your feet, put your socks on, pull your trousers up, get your so, uh, top on, get your jacket on. Ready, steady, go. Pull the sleeping bag, get out, get your stuff in the pulp, get going. So by breaking it down, it stopped that panic attack, or stopped that overwhelming feeling I had. So I headed on. What was really interesting was I didn't get to the checkpoint until 11 o'clock the next morning. So five hours I was walking until I got to that checkpoint. So if I'd kept going through the night to get there, I'd have been in real trouble. So it was a good decision. So adjusting the plan, so this is about achieving a big goal and adjusting the plan on the roof. I got to that checkpoint, there were only three people there. I couldn't understand what happened. Why, why was all these people started? 100 people started this race and only three people got to this checkpoint. And this checkpoint's in the middle of nowhere. What I learned and what I didn't know was the carnage that happened behind me during the night. So during the night, because the temperatures had got so cold, people had panicked, people had got scared, people hadn't thought properly. And in those conditions, you have to be really logical about your thinking. You have to be thinking about your, your plan. So for, for instance, on the training night we went out, someone spilled fuel on their finger because they were panicking a bit. Fuel on the finger, it went, turned to frostbite in seconds. Frostbite is, has anyone ever seen frostbite out of interest? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Frostbite's pretty horrible. It's, it, it basically just goes grey, it looks like grey ash in the skin, dead. Once you've got it, you can't get rid of it. It takes a long time to get rid of it and you, and you will always get it back. So during that night we had a Polish guy lost these two fingers on his hand uh, because of the cold. We had a guy who lost two, finger, two toes on his feet. He's only just lost them actually. It was on uh, social media recently. So he got frostbite that night and lost his toes recently. The Mexican I showed you at the beginning. So a couple of my friends were going along and they heard this guy panicking and basically crying in his sleeping bag. They, and he was begging for help. They stopped to help him. He had all his clothes on in his sleeping bag, including his down jacket, his hat and everything and he was freezing. <clears throat> they stopped to help him to get into the checkpoint. They got to, unfortunately, one of my friends got frostbite on his finger and couldn't carry on, so they pulled him out. But at that checkpoint, at the 56 mile mark, 40 people pulled out. Now imagine 40 people, it's 30, 35 miles from the nearest help. You can't fly a helicopter in those kind of conditions. You can only get to someone in a skidoo, and a skidoo can only take one person out. And it takes about three, three and a half hours for the skidoo to get there and to get back. So seven hour round trip for the skidoo. It took me two days to get all those people out from that uh, first night's carnage. It was basically, it was carnage. Anyway, I cracked on. So I was, I was feeling good. So this was, this was me stopping on the, the first night. It wasn't actually, that was a picture they took in training because there was no cameraman around when I was stopping. But the, I cracked on, so I went on the next day, so I moved on to, uh, towards the, the, the 96 mile mark was the next checkpoint, so 40 miles from that checkpoint. And it was a beautiful day, we were following a lake, frozen lake, stunning scenery. And then as we went into the evening, I stopped, made myself a coffee before we headed off into the evening. And then I got into the, and the temperature started dropping again. Started feeling tired. And as the evening went on, I was pushing, I was doing really well, I was going quite quickly. I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience when you're really tired. Has anyone ever had hallucinations when they're tired? You've had hallucinations. What did you see? I don't remember. What? I don't remember. You don't remember. <laughs> but it's, it's so real when you have it. I mean, so I, the first time I experienced an hallucination actually was when I was doing an event called the Oscar Child of Mont Blanc. It's 100 miles round Mont Blanc. 
and I was, it was about 80 miles in, I was climbing up one of the Alps and I was with someone. We were walking up and I stopped to help the guy at the side of the trail because he was sitting down and he wasn't looking great. And so I said, look, can I help you? Are you okay? Do you want to... And the friend I was with said, who are you talking to? I said, I'm talking to this guy here. He said, oh, it's a rock. <laughs> that was my first experience of real hallucination that was real in my mind. So this second evening, I'm, crack I'm going through the night, through into the night. It was a 20 mile straight road. And I started seeing things. I started seeing people on the side of the trails. I started seeing skidoos. I thought, oh, there's some help. I'll go and talk to them, see how far I've got to go. I started seeing, I saw a Sherman tank at one point. On the side of as real as you're sitting here now, I saw a Sherman tank inside the trail. But the most bizarre hallucination I had that night was, as I was walking along, I came to this point, I, had to, I stopped. And there was a movie screen in front of me. <laughs> it, 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 like, right. I, look, I shook my head, because I knew it must be a shook my head, but it's still there. So you imagine, I'm in all my Arctic gear, it's pulled behind me, mask up, hat on, and I stood there and I started touching this screen. It said the people photographed me, I had a white coat that was turned up and taking me away from Looney Hole. <laughs> touching this screen. But I, in the end, I, I just had to keep playing it. It was so real. I, I bashed through it and carried on. <clears throat> so I thought, I need to do something. I'm, I'm losing it here. So what do I do? So when you're tired, it? when you're tired and you're driving, what do you do? Drink coffee is good, yeah. yeah. Stop him, I wasn't going to stop him. Jogging in the ditch. Sorry? Jogging in the ditch. <laughs> you're driving to a ditch, okay. A cold ditch, if you want to. Well, wind the window down, yeah. yeah. At minus 55, it didn't really, I didn't have that option. Sing. Sing. Sing, yeah. Has anyone ever done that when they turn the radio up yeah. and sung along to the radio? So I thought, right, I'm going to sing. So again, imagine, I'm in all this Arctic gear, and I'm walking along. I started singing Queen songs, Elvis songs, anything I could try and remember some words to. But there was one song, only one song that I can remember all the words to. Now, some of the people who aren't English this room might not know this. It's Nelly the Elephant. And it goes like this. Nelly the Elephant packed the trunk and said goodbye to the circus. And I did this over and over and over again. The most stupid kid song that I can remember was Nelly the Elephant. But it kept me going through that night. I got to the 96 mile mark about two in the morning. Absolutely nice. But one of the reasons for mentioning this, and it, it is a story and it's relevant to there, but we talk about achieving big goals. And having a, I didn't have a strategy for how to handle that. If you have a strategy to how to handle the hard times as they come along, whatever those hard times might be, it'll help when you get there. So having a strategy is really important. How do you handle those hard times? So adapting the plan, I talked about as I went into that first night, and having a strategy for handling the hard times. So I then headed off the next day. So the next morning I woke up, the monitor on the side of this building was minus 45, minus 50. Overnight, I got four or five hours sleep that night in this rest stop. Overnight, they have been bringing people in from that uh, checkpoint at Doggrave Lake. And there were, it was like a scene from a Vietnam War movie. There were people everywhere, drips and blanket. It was, it was awful. So I headed off, um, this guy, Daniel here, both of us headed off into the, the next day. And we had about a 44 mile leg, so about 60 kilometer leg to do on this third day. And I wanted to crack it in one go. I didn't want to stop on the side of the trail again. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't want to do it again. So I wanted to get this done as fast as I could. So I actually ran quite a lot this day. I ran and walked and ran and walked. We had to go back across about nine lakes. One of them was nine miles wide. It took three hours to go across it. During this day, I started seeing wolf prints along the trail as well. Now, I wasn't expecting to see wolf prints, so that was quite an experience seeing. Well, especially when you've got a pulp attached to you, you can't really turn around much. You know, you start looking into the trees, trying to see if you can spot some eyes looking at you. So I got to the next checkpoint, which is a place called Ken Lake. And I was, it was about two in the morning, I was exhausted. I really had to dig deep to get there. So I was about 140 mile mark. I really, really had to dig deep to push myself through the night to get there. And the temperatures were dropping as well as we were going across these lakes, or as I was going across these lakes. I didn't see anyone for, well, for the whole day, really. I left Daniel after about two hours. 
So I got to the, the, there and I set up my tent and got my sleeping bag. I wanted to get two hours sleep, two and a half hours sleep, and I was so tired. <clears throat> and I had a satellite phone with me, so I've got the satellite phone out and I phoned my wife. And I said to her, I said, oh, I am so drained, I'm so tired, I'm so exhausted. And she just said a couple of things to me. She said, I'm really proud of you, you're doing brilliantly, keep going. Now, that got me fired up. Two hours sleep, two and a half hours sleep. I was up the next morning and I was off. Now, why do I share that with you? I share that with you because when you're taking on one of these big goals you're thinking about, one of these big challenges you're thinking about, you know you're going to go through tough times. Because if it's a big goal, it's not going to be easy to achieve. You need to have people that you respect, that you can turn to, that you can talk to. To, up, to just give you that boost of confidence when it gets hard, to lift your eyes up when your eyes go down, to make you feel, you know, when you go home and you're feeling that it hasn't gone right today, who's the person you're going to talk to? Who's going to lift you up? And maybe you've got one or two of those, but, you know, in that instance, it was my wife and it worked brilliantly. It got me really fired up for the next day. She only had to say a few things, but I respect what she said. So I also learned. And this again is about how to handle those hard times, is who's rooting for you? If you're going for a big goal, there's a lot of people who tell you the reasons why you can't achieve. There's a lot of people who tell you, you know, don't try, you might fail, don't go for it, what's the point? You know, you come to the But then you need to, who, who's, your, who's your cheerleaders? Who your, who's your fans? Who are the people who are going to support you when you need it? And I was really lucky, and I didn't realise this at the time. I had a GPS which was attached to my harness and had three flashing green lights on it. And this GPS was sending data off to the internet. And I think I know some of you guys were tracking me while I was, was out there. And you know, I, even though I was on my own for nearly six days and 19 hours, I never felt on my own. Because it just happened to be over my heart. I mean that's but I had this GPS tracking over, and so I never felt it was a moment. I knew I had support of friends and family and colleagues all the time. And again, you know, who, who are your cheerleaders? Who's your family? Who's supporting you when you take on a big goal? Whether it's a personal goal, a business goal, or a sporting goal. So that was a, something I didn't think about. That's one of the things I learned. <coughs> so I got, so the rest of the days were, were there were challenges during them, it got tough, going through things like ice fields on, on, on rivers was an incredible uh, experience. I don't know if anyone's ever seen an ice flow that stops and jumbles up, jump ice jumble on a river where you end up with ice blocks the size of cars that you've got to try and work your way round and over, pulling a pulp behind you. You know, it can take you two hours to do a mile, but you've just got to keep going. So there were challenges over those few days. Anyway, I got to the penultimate checkpoint and I had 70 miles to go. And I set off at about 11 o'clock on a Saturday evening, I think it was, into the night, which is not the best time to go because you know you've got to go through that dead zone of 2, 3 in the morning where it's never great to be doing anything. So I headed off and it was quite a tough day, actually, that day. It was really, I was really having to push hard. I had 70 miles to go, or 100 kilometres to go. And as I went through that, I started having some big hills we had to go up and down. And it was on a, a, quite a, a, a reasonable road, uh, covered in snow. And I thought, you know, I've been pulling this plastic tray behind me for five days now. <coughs> and I got to the top of one of those hills and I thought, time for you to do some work. So I took my harness off, sat on the tray on my pulp, and I started sledging down the hills. And that was one of the best feelings in the world, was I was pulling this thing for those days, and suddenly it was working for me. It was brilliant. So I, I started going a bit mad on this day. And I, I had an iPod with me, which I, batteries don't work very well at minus 55 degrees, which I learned, because I had a camera, which didn't even get one photo out of it before the batteries were dead. But I had this iPod with me, which I kept very close uh, inside my jacket, so it was warm, and I kept it for the moment I needed it. Now you know at the beginning of this I played that song, Blur's Song 2. Right, that's a trigger song for me. 
do, 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 do you guys have trigger songs, songs that make you feel good, that, make, that inspire you, that push you on? Do you have a trigger song or a song that really does motivate you? So you put it on, it really motivates you. So song two for me does it. That's a real push. It pushes me to do something. But I've got a, a collection of those on a playlist on my iPod. So I put that on as I was going down one of the tracks. And in fact, there was a cameraman sitting in the skidoo. I didn't know that. But if you look at this, is me dancing and jumping around as I'm walking down this trail, keep myself motivated. First song that comes on is Walking on Sunshine. <laughs> that's the one that really uh, gets me going to start with. There's another one that's an old soul song called Ain't No Stopping Us Now. Now that's a great song. When, you, when you're walking and you keep pushing, it ain't no stopping us now. But why is this useful? Because psychologically, we need to have those things that motivate us, things that push us when things get hard. So, you know, I've just shared with you a few ideas about how to handle hard times. I was also interested, so I got to the 30, 35 miles from the finish, so I got to this farm called Penny Farm, and there's a picture at the beginning of me sitting there with a sign on my, my lap. It's actually a private home in the middle of nowhere. And they, they, they make you food, they welcome you in. Well, I didn't realise what was in the lasagna, actually. What they do is they kill bears in the summer and then they freeze them and put <coughs> bear lasagna. Uh, but they, when I got there, it was a really interesting experience. I, I, I was, I, at this point, by the way, I knew I was leaving. I did, up, up until probably three days before, I'd phoned home and one of the kids had said to me, you know, Dad, you're leaving. I said, no, I'm not leaving. There's loads of people in front of me. But actually, I was leading the 300 mile or 500 kilometre race. And I hadn't really thought about winning until I got to this last checkpoint. So I got to this checkpoint, and I walked in, I thought, I must be a good 12 hours ahead of the last person. And as I walked in, they said, oh, Daniel left the last checkpoint four hours ago. I was like panicking. Hang on a second, that means he's eight hours behind me. I want to get probably five hours sleep here if I can. So that means he's going to be three hours behind me. If something goes wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to lose my, my place. So I, 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 I did get some rest, about two and a half hours, my ankles at this point are swollen right up like, from repetitive uh, movement. I had to lie down on my legs like, just to get the ankles to reduce further, but I, was, I couldn't sleep so I was worried about Daniel catching me. I mean it's just crazy, just finishing this event would have been good enough. So I got that two hours sleep, I headed off. Now then I thought, right, being competitive that I am, I thought, right, if I go really quickly, because he was coming out the way I was going back, so we had to cross over. If I really push hard, and I do this, then I'm going to demoralise him when I overtake him, because he knows he's got a long way to go. So I pushed as hard as I could, five hours in, five hours in, I overtook him. So then I knew he had ten hours at least, even if he didn't stop. The funny thing was, we laughed about this in the bar on, when we all finished. He didn't care. I didn't know he didn't care. <laughs> and he had 12 hours sleep at that farm. And I loved it. So, I, so there's a time to be competitive and time not to be. I headed off uh, that evening, and that was one of the hardest nights actually. So we talk about the plan. You know, the plan I had two hours, 10 minutes, two hours, 10 minutes, two hours, 10 minutes, 30 minutes water. I broke it down that night to 14 minutes walking and then a minute of sleeping. And then 14 minutes walking and a minute of sleep. Right? And, and I tell you, when you're that tired, 14 minutes really drags. So you know you, and sometimes you cheat, you kind of five seconds early, you stop. <laughs> but that got me through. And at four o'clock in the morning on that last night, I sat down on my pulp with a hot chocolate and a, a nutty bar of energy thing. And I sat down, and I know it's four o'clock, because again, when you're looking forward to your stops, you know you stop exactly on time. So I sat down at 4.17, I woke up, hot chocolate on the floor, food on the floor, just, I totally gone for 17 minutes. When I woke up, there were all these footprints around the pulp, big wolf footprints around the pulp. And so that, that meant, I suddenly thought, oh, I better get moving. <laughs> I better not stop like this again. I was only an hour and a half from the finish then, and I got, to the, uh, I got through to the finish, and it was one of the most underwhelming finishes in any event I've ever done. So I turned up at 5.30 in the morning, I, could hardly, I couldn't really find the finish because some of the markers had been moved by locals in this little town. And I got to the, the, the finish area and I had to bang on the window to wake them up because they were all asleep. Because <laughs> they weren't expecting me. So, I kind of take 
you through some of the steps. There's one final ingredient I'd share with you to achieve your big goal. So we've talked about whatever your big goal is, whatever you were thinking about when you put your hand up at the beginning, whatever your big goal is. We've talked about the timeline before you even start. We've talked about the reasons why and layering on those reasons why. We've talked about preparation, we've talked about plan, we've talked about actually going for it. We've talked about handling the hard times, adapting the plan. But if you want to succeed in any plan, is you've got to focus. You've got to focus your attention on that goal. It's no good it being something on the side that you're doing as well as everything else. It's no good you just come up with this great plan and don't. No one achieves anything significant without focus. And that's one of the things I've learned as well is if I'm focusing on a specific sporting goal or a specific personal development goal, you have to do that without distraction. It doesn't mean that's the only thing you're doing in your life, but in that area, that's, the focus is so important. So those are the steps we're talking through. All of those uh, steps there to be able to, this, having that reason why I can't enforce, re reinforce that point enough about layering on the reasons why. Getting that external commitment. But don't forget, stepping over the start line is really hard and something you have to commit to. But also, it's not about enduring the journey. Too often we set ourselves goals, whether it's business or personal or sports, and we endure the journey. And we get to the end and go, oh, thank God that's over. You've got to enjoy the journey. You've only got one life. We've only got one chance to do this. You've got to enjoy it while you're here. You've got to enjoy that journey. If you're enduring every day, that's not much fun, is it? So enjoy it. And celebrate <coughs> success. Celebrate small successes. So I would celebrate 14 minutes of walking by sleeping for a minute. I would celebrate two hours of walking by having hot chocolate. Set yourself small celebrations as well on the way. Because that, that psychologically, that enforces in the brain that success is good. If you keep giving yourself little rewards, it might be just be get up and walk for a coffee because you've just done a big challenge for an hour or done something. Get up and just give yourself a, split, a significant reward because it layers on that psychological feeling that success is good. So I said at the beginning of this that I, wrote, I, was, I did this to raise some money for um, that little girl and I got this video back just a couple of months ago. So I'll show this video. 